know, you know what? Um, over the years, I've gotten so used to my voice because of all these YouTube videos that I don't even, it doesn't sound weird to me anymore, but I remember when I first started, I was like, God, I sound so nasally. I sound, and I sound like a man. <laughs> <laughs> like, like hearing yourself on right? And then you're just like, well, it is what it is, so I'm over it, you know? Anyway, <laughs> so... Okay, so when you contacted me, you were on the very low calorie protocol of Dr. Simeon's HCG protocol. Was that are, was this your second round, or is like is it more than that? How many rounds have you done? It was just the second okay. round. Got it. And it and it had been and it like almost a year. Um, yeah, and you well, found me that, through. That was last May. Yeah, but, so you took a nice big break. Um, but anyways, not, we don't need to get back into that. But um. I always get excited only because I'm really curious to how you're doing and how that conversation went because in our consult, you know, with everybody that comes to me while they're on the HCG protocol, my approach has to dramatically adjust. And, um, cause in the end, our goal is that you stay detached from this as a medical procedure. So, a lot of times people come to me and they're on a diet. I mean, they're doing it to lose weight. They're doing it for all sorts of emotional reasons. And so my goal is to kind of separate those emotions from the process as best I can to reduce the damages that could be done behaviorally when the protocol's over. Right. Well, so I think like you're me talking to, you know, it really, made a big impact on me, you know, I mean, I, it really, like, really helped, and, and so I, you know, I was, like, you know, I take, like, notes, I have this little notebook, and I write all this stuff in, in this little notebook, you know, yeah. because I may not remember what I'm thinking, you know, totally. but, um, and so I, I was just, I think I'm very good at, at, Making excuses. I'm very good at rationalizing. I'm very good at kidding myself. You know, <laughs> aren't we all? <laughs> Isn't that the truth? Years. Right. And I think deep down inside, or I know, I don't think I know deep down inside, mm -hmm. I was still doing the HCG diet. <laughs> yes. Like, I could, I could make myself think I'm doing it right. for all hormonal reasons. I you know. know. No, I yeah. in end goal was for sure to lose yeah. weight. That had so, to have kind of hurt a little bit. I mean, I just have to, and I was like, hey, you know, I have to, I have to be real. I have to admit this to myself. And, and then, you know, what happened is basically when I do that, I just hide at home. I don't go anywhere. I don't do anything mm -hmm. because I can't do anything. And so my friend like invited us to go to their friends and play a game night, you know, and, and I'm there and I'm just like, you know, I'm so sick of not being a normal person. I'm so tired of not living. Yes. And I'm just like, screw it. I'm, okay. I'm getting off this protocol thing, whatever. I'm stopping it because I, ha I you know, it's just not good. Like, okay. I'm just not good for me. And Okay. Do you recall I, when we talked in our consult, how I was like, you're a victim at one point of this side, and then you're a victim at the other side. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Right? And did you, did you mm -hmm. see that as a witness? Did you witness the... At this point, I'm pissed off about not mm -hmm. being able to participate as a human being. You know, right? Yeah, and I and I, and I realized I yeah. could, you know, I had like, you know, one maybe two drinks and like a minimum, minimal, minimal amount of, of, you know, food, like not yeah. hardly any, you know. Yeah, so I, I wasn't stuffed. I wasn't full. Yeah, nothing like that. I mean, you still have that H, the effect of HCG in your body, right? Right. I mean, I don't really. You know, when I was kind of not really noticing too much of, sure. of, of, I don't know, I seemed like I was more hungry than I should be. Or sure. I didn't, I didn't really well, Karen, tell me how long, how long had you been on the protocol? 10 days when we oh, talked? Yeah, it was only maybe, maybe. 12. So a little over a week. Yeah. So that still, that still has hormonal, you know, right. there is right. still, I mean, you're injecting a pregnancy hormone. It's going to impact your endocrine system. You know, and then when you reduce your foods to such a drastic amount. So my point is, um, first of all, congratulations. You're being real with yourself. That's awesome. Awesome. Right. I mean, I know that it's I, hard. I didn't do it. I, you know, I know that I was probably going to 
mess up my system by not getting off properly. But well, like, the, you know, what you might have recognized in telling yourself the truth that I'm doing this to gratify my desires to be thin for all those emotional reasons that ultimately what happens, and this is take notes here, this is what's going to be written in this um, extended version of Weight Loss Apocalypse, all this detail, okay? When you... When you've attached all these emotional needs to the protocol, it's not a protocol anymore. It's a diet, right? Meaning, exactly. you know, meaning it's serving an emotional need. It has nothing to do with the body. What happens when you serve that emotional need and it gets that gratification of thinness is that the end consequence is a pro promoted stress with food when the protocol's over because you've reached this gratification right? You're getting that emotional gratification. And even if you're a victim of feeling restricted from food and being around people and just being a normal human being, you still have a little anxiety about regaining weight because that means you're losing what you feel you gained by losing weight. You following right. me? I mean, I'm always petrified of yeah. gaining. It's the, you're petrified even though you're pissed off about being restricted. So you have these two emotions that are kind of playing tug of war. There's the anxiety oh, of regaining oh, weight. Tug of war. Yeah, yes. but there's this disconnection as a human. Remember uh, when, I don't know if we went over this, but how there's like this competition between this, this uh, you know, pack animal need to want to feel superior and wanted and loved and connected through thinness, which is competing yeah. with your survival mechanisms as an animal around food. And so it's just like clash, right? And in the end, yeah. we both know which one evolutionarily is more dominant, which is more dominant to your survival. Feeling right. loved the or food. Eating, yeah. You got it. Food is yeah. always going to win out in the end, in the end. Okay. So the problem, or at least if there's anything you might have seen, I'm hoping that it's not for me, I'm a victim, not because I can't participate. It's my emotional attachment to this round is going to end in a full cycle. I will end up regaining all the weight back because of all that tension. Oh, exactly. Yeah, that if you see, for the right reason. Well, yeah. well, whatever the reason, the outcome, the reason you had, the outcome is repeat. Mm -hmm. It's what you've always done. So oh, you yeah. can't expect a different result, right? That right. stress and anxiety, as you get that gratification of the weight loss, that promotes stress and anxiety with food when it's over, which ultimately promotes hyper-restriction, which maximizes your victimization around feeling disconnected around food. So your likelihood of overeating and, over and binge eating, and when this is over, is far higher. The probability of you having that explosive kind of compensation with food when this is over is high, much higher than if you had just done some like Weight Watchers program. So this is where I believe the HCG protocol done as an emotional diet is dangerous. I believe it should to some degree be regulated. In my yeah. mind, if we take this as a big picture, I really can foresee the HCG protocol being um, something done in a clinical environment where people get help with mm -hmm. eating disorders. Yeah. I know it sounds counterintuitive, but you know, people who are 400 pounds and 500 pounds, yeah. it's a medical solution for them that can actually aid in their recovery process, but it requires all this work ahead of time. Right? So do you see where this could be paired together? It's a physical solution. Would you say that you are physically in a position to where the HCG protocol equal to, let's just say gastric bypass, that you would say you're a good candidate for that? No. <laughs> now it sounds a little silly, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I'm, well, you know, all those charts, I mean, they might classify me as obese because of my height, but I mean, anyone that would look at me would be like, no. Why you know. would you do that? Yeah. Well, and, and we, outside of just looks and weight, obviously there's a lot of endocrinology that goes into really address, looking at the overall issue. But in the end, when someone's actual truthful drive is self preservation, psychologically, there's a problem that, mm -hmm. that becomes a risk. 
because you're using it as a defense mechanism to your ego or your psyche. It's not a medical procedure anymore. You know, so well, the, that, yeah. that's why all these people are gaining all the way back, yeah. even after yeah, after gastric bypass and all. You know, yeah, and, yeah. I mean, I'm a GI nurse. I see all the complications. Oh, yeah, you do. If you're a chief, you, yeah, you do see that. Well, and, and they, I just think that the issue is the lack of awareness around body image and its impact on how people um, identify themselves and how it impacts how they identify in survival mode with other, with our thin supremacy culture. Right. So I do believe that that industry, you know, they really are doing the best they can with what they're aware of. Um, And I do think there's a lot of negligence in that because people just think it's a physical problem and you're addicted to food. And that's so negligent to the emotional impact that, that is underlying all that. Um, but at some point, like all natural learning curves, people who have integrity, who are in that industry, who want to help people will be open to hearing the actual solutions that are actual that can work versus let's just cut your stomach and mm-hmm. put a balloon in there. And <laughs> right. Cause then if you don't, if you don't fix the other part, I mean, it, they may be going in and getting that surgery for medical view because they have high blood pressure. Of and course. Diabetes and blah, blah, blah. But, yeah, but if it's primarily longer, because they want to feel better about themselves, we got problems. Right. The more weight they lose, then it's going to turn into the other. Like, mm-hmm. oh, I want to get into this, you know, size or whatever. It just becomes an emotional problem, a pride issue, you know. And then when you become prideful about your weight loss and it's visible, Mm-hmm. How does that um, pride forces, and that inflation yeah. impact how they relate to food as their pride and in, in, in inflated self sense of success? How, success, success. How does that affect their fear of losing it? Right. So if you are inflating your success emotionally and promoting it socially, you now have added paranoia. You have now added defensiveness to the equation. And how does paranoia and defensiveness of body image impact how people relate to restrictions and to food? It puts it under pressure. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm hoping you're connecting your own experience to what I'm saying as we be witness this idea with other people. Look at what your weight loss And how it has pressurized your relationship to when you've taken pride in it and you've promoted it, right? Displayed it. You've put your thinnerness on display. How does that affect your relationship with, with food? It's totally dysfunctional and it pressurizes it. Yeah. And I think losing weight and then gaining it back almost makes you feel worse than it the does. Being the way you started at. Yeah, what you're just described has <laughs> actual terminology. It's called relative deprivation. Okay, so what happens when you um, take a a gain and you make it a new normal? It's I call it a zero point. Okay, if you go back to where you were before, it's a bigger loss because your yeah. new normal in terms of like, let's just use money in social science terms. They it's, it, it's always done in relation to social acceptance or if you attain a socially promoted a goal like mm-hmm. making money. Um, so if you come out of college and you get offered a job for $45,000 to a 22 year old college graduate, that's huge. That's like, I am in it. I am now in the system and I'm working it. And they, they, they really feel gratitude and they're amazed at the fact that they have a a salary. It's not a minimum wage. I mean, that's freaking luck nowadays, right? So if they get in that system and somehow they're promoted or they get a bonus or whatever that is, they're no longer, um, good with 45,000. Right. Right. (laughs) Okay. So, so it's called relative deprivation and, and also you have, diminishing returns as your expectations rise, rising expectations. So your neutral point of what you believe is normal shifts. 
So as in terms of how um, people in weight loss um, experience this, if you lose weight, so let's just imagine you're 200 pounds at your highest and you do the HCG protocol or something very radical, okay, or you get, you know, gastric bypass or um, whatever done, or you do Shakeology or you do something like that. Yeah, yeah. Metafast. And you lose and you get down to 150, okay? And that is your like, I did it, destination weight, right? Yeah. For someone who's, let's just say, 5'8 or 5'6. When you're 200 pounds, you know, 150 is dramatic. So once someone hits that 150, that becomes what they expect, the new zero point. So, and to some degree, when you are a victim of being restricted, a lot of people give it grace. They'll say, I'm willing to go back to 170 because I need to be a normal person, right? So there's a, right. so there's depending on where the person is psychologically that kind of gauges how they respond to that weight loss. If they, however, regain the weight up to 200 pounds, they feel worse about themselves at the same weight that they were before because the regain is symbolic of your failure. You yes. actually failed. And uh -huh. so anything less or anything more than that zone you've decided is your new norm feels way worse after loss. So once someone successfully loses weight, if they regain it, it is symbolic of and proof that you're a piece of shit. Again, that's relative to the culture of thin supremacy because there's we're gaining and losing weight on a daily basis because we shit, we eat, we have menstrual yeah. cycles. And so there's a degree of lenience when we have an anorexic, when someone is in anorexia, one pound can make them feel terrible. Like horrific, right. right? And so their emotional reaction is identical to the obese person. It just takes less wiggle yeah. room. Um, anyway, so you're you're correct. When you lost the weight and then regained the regain, even though it's the same exact size and weight you were before, it now feels ten times worse. Because you've not only attached your new normal to whatever weight you were at but you've also attached negative symbolism to the regain. Yeah. I always that's, say that's when, exactly where I'm, that's exactly where I'm at yeah, right now. That is what you get for being a thin supremacist. And I yeah. say that in love and kindness and grace, but that's the life of a thin supremacist. I mean, your <laughs> goal is always to be thinner and anything fatter is seen as failure, a piece of shit. You're dumb. You're stupid. You can't handle it. You're a loser. I mean, so that's the belief system that you're supporting. And because you believe it, you believe it in your heart. You actually believe it, at least with yourself. You may not feel that way about others, but you do within yourself because you have this higher standard for yourself, right? Yeah. You feel the shame because you've attached pride to the thinnerness. So we, when we look at this, where does the shame begin? Do you begin with shame or does it begin with pride? That's don't you agree? That's a that's an important thing for you to observe or witness. Where uh, does this feeling bad about your weight begin? Oh, it did it, it. I mean, way long ago. Well, way long ago. Of course, in terms of your life, but feeling bad. If we look at if we break down the equation of how someone comes to a negative feeling about something. How does someone get negative, become negative about something? What is, what do they have to have in place to have the result of that's bad? Um, like low self-esteem or. Okay. I, it, I'm, I'm going way more simple than that. You're, that was a deep, <laughs> nice, good answer. Of course, but it's in relation to a judgment, right? This we're going elementary right now. You can't, to have a bad assumption of something unless you are comparing it to an alternative, right? To, to have the judgment of that's bad. Don't you have to compare it to something to know it's bad? Yes. Right. Okay. That's what I'm talking about. Go elementary in order for someone to feel bad about something, they have to hold in mind 
something better they are comparing it to. That's called, you know, it's a relative judgment. It's right. relative, right? Bad and good. Which, so in order to have any sense of bad, it has to be lacking goodness. Okay? Correct. That's how we do it. That's how all criticism works. You don't just criticize. You have to hold in mind an ideal. So you, in your mind, there is an ideal. You compare what you're observing to it. The ideal is, is so the difference between the two is what creates um, discontent or that negative, like this isn't got that, it's not this, you're lacking this, you have too much of that, you know. So that's how we come to all judgments. All judgment requires a, an ideal that you are comparing the object, the person, the behavior to. Yeah. Okay. So when you feel bad about your body, how, how do you come to my body sucks? I mean, I, I think I'm getting better about accepting the fact that this ideal that I've always been looking at. Okay. So good. Completely. Completely unrealistic. I know, but but hold on a second. And I love that you're coming to be aware of, of that, that it's like out of touch with what's realistic. Um, but the what I it's very simple. How do you come to feeling bad about your body? You are comparing it to an ideal. And what you just said is so important. So I want to add this to it that you believe the ideal is achievable. Because, for example, if you're if you were told you have to be three inches taller and that's the goal and that's the ideal, well, is that achievable for you? No. So how serious would you take that criticism? Would you feel bad? No. You might initially go, my body sucks, but there's nothing I can do about it. So then what happens right. to that goal? Is it basically becomes irrelevant? Right. I mean, unless okay. you invent some stretching machine. Exactly. <laughs> you know, like, or like if you can add vertebrae and, right. um, and it doesn't cause pain. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, so you wear high heels, but you're, once you come to, and so, and I've had this with a lot of clients for myself, hairy arms. I had hairy arms growing up as I've gotten older. They've really gotten much less and they're more, Blonde, but when I was in junior high, I was really self, I hated my arms and I would cover them up. I mean, I went kind of to great length um, and partly because I was made fun of. And so that was the first time I realized there's something wrong with the hair on my arms. Uh -huh. You know, so I real, so that's where an ideal we, we made aware there's no hair on your arms is better. Well, I have hair on my arms. The difference between the two created like, I've got something wrong with me. So there's discontent. So then in order to remove the discontent, we do things, shave our arms, cover them up. I just covered them up anyway. So when I one time shaved my arms and I hated the stubble. So I, in my mind, I got to the point where I hated the stubble more than I hated the hair. <laughs> and yeah. I realized I have hairy arms. I, and I got over it. I mean, it took about a year. But I haven't cared since that moment. I know there's an ideal out there for women to be hairless. It does exist. Right? Right. It's really kind of a new one. It's like over the course of the last century. And it's here in America. It's not there everywhere. But either way, I, I'm aware of that ideal. And I don't care about it because I'm not, it's not worth the work. So for you, the more you care about something or the more important it is to you, the more discontent or the more critical we become of our reality. So when you, when you say I'm seeing now how unrealistic this ideal is in my head, that's huge. Why do you think in terms of what we're talking about, why is recognizing how the unreachability of your goal that you've been holding yourself to, why is that important? 
because then it makes it unrelative or it, well, it makes it not important for, you know, like, yeah, well, it diminishes the space between your reality and what you expect. So the larger the distance between what you expect and your reality, the worse you feel about yourself. Make sense? The bigger yeah. the difference between the goal you want and what you have, the more right. shame, the right. more hiding, exactly. the more intensity, the more irritability you get because of because of it in terms of survival yeah. mode. The more survival mode you experience. So as you see, that goal isn't reachable. As if I'm being asked to add three inches to my right. height as a 40-year-old or a 35-year-old woman, you know. What yeah. happens is the distance gets smaller. And so you do start to feel more better in your own skin. It doesn't mean you feel good in your own skin at this moment. You just feel a little bit less shitty. Right. So what, like what happens if, okay, so like my, you know, because I, I used to kind of go by those charts or whatever, and I knew, like, that was kind of impossible. But I, I just had this always, like, this 120, like, I have to get to 120, you know, this number. And, <laughs> it's, like, burned and it's like, in your brain, you know, in that amygdala. It's, like, burned into that. Like, right. And it's, like, okay, that's impo That's going to be, that's impossible because I couldn't even maintain that in high school. And I've had two kids, and I've. 47, you know, there's like so it's clearly a fantasy at some point you fantasized right. about it, but you, in order for you to have actually implanted it or embedded it in, in your safe zone of the brain, you had to have believed it was reachable. It is reachable. So when someone has the belief that it is attainable, that's where, and that's where the problem exists. Right. Well, and the funny thing is I never, ever could even get close to that. That doesn't matter. That's reality. But I mean, doesn't so mean like, in your fantasy you thought it was reachable. That's the problem is even if your current reality is indicating, hell no, it's not going to happen, you're right. still going to hold yourself to it because you believe somewhere in there the belief is that it is attainable. You wouldn't yeah. hold it into that. Your You wouldn't be etched in into your brain if you didn't think it was achievable. You wouldn't have allowed right. it to become internalized. So again, the word used here is that you internalized it. That means that you believed it is a truth and it is reachable and you are held to it. Right. That I, sucks I, for you, doesn't it? Yeah, so I, I think now I, I truly believe that's not, that's not reachable. How does that feel? Well, I mean, yeah, it feels, it, it feels great. Relieving. However, however, I, I do truly feel that that's 20 pounds less than I am now is totally reachable because I was just there. Like, well, of course. Okay. So, like, so it can I'm be reachable. Okay. So that's fine. And, and that's the thing. It can be reachable. It, it, there, this is the thing. It doesn't ha the problem is what does it take now to reach it? What does it take yeah. to reach it? Is that realistic? So now it's not just is the goal realistic, but is what it takes to reach it realistic? Right. And, That's and, where we need to make adjustments now. And when I was, you know, when I want it fast, like I just want it, I mean, I think it may be over time, if I, you know, over time, if you lose it very slow, you know, then it's a little more reachable than if, Okay, let me do this protocol so I can well, lose 20 pounds. Totally. Like what yeah. you're saying is if my body is given a chance to do it on its own time, right. while I live a way I want to live, that's yeah. realistic. Sure. But, you know, yeah. the only way that you're going to have that relaxed space, because what you're describing, is not doesn't that sound idealistic in a way? Yeah. Well, it oh, is. Yeah. It To me, though, it's like, well, that's actually where we're trying to get you is to be like, but the only reason why it's considered idealistic is because you have these emotional needs to be thinner and you need to be thinner now. That's what makes it unrealistic is the right. emotional drive that you're bringing to it. If you were in a coma or completely, you know, kept from awareness, it would be absolutely within reach. If it's within your body's overall metabolic, you know, mm -hmm. ideal regulation, 
you know, where your, your thyroid and your adrenals and your ovaries and your uterus and your brain and your pituitary and all of these things are getting like a confident message from how much fat you have. It'll, it'll happen, but you have to put, keep it positive, right? If you stress everything out, it might be promoting more weight gain. So this is really so dynamic. Right. So you could say, yeah, I should be 20 pounds less unless I'm under stress, unless I, you know, <laughs> uh -huh. you see what I mean? It's like, well, it's you can't even say it in a factual way, because unless I'm not in menopause, unless I'm. You know what I'm saying? Unless I'm not over consuming a lot. There's a lot of things right. that go into that. So, yeah. of course, yeah. it's realistic if it's within reach of your apps, the reality of your actual existence, how yeah. you respond to stress, how you respond to, do you get enough sleep? How much sun exposure right. do you get? I mean, think of all of the environmental influence to your metabolism. It's massive. It's yeah. beyond our understanding of it. We cognitively and intellectually don't really get it. You know, pressure gradients that come in through the weather. How does that impact you? Full moons. Think of all of the things that actually impact your endocrine system so that our bodies can survive all of what's going on in the universe. Gravitational waves. I mean, now we're getting crazy, right? <laughs> How does my yeah. body fat respond to <laughs> waves of gravity coming from the sun? Anyway, right. so, so the question is, what does your reality of life promote in terms of your metabolism and your body fat? How do we right, know I mean, that? I, yeah, I do. I, because I've lived, I've never, ever lived in the gray area. I, I've mm -hmm. never, ever not lived in deprivation or been or over, yeah. not necessarily always binging, but over excess, you know, eating yeah. past hunger or eating when not hungry, you know, yeah. But, that I've you know, never ever lived in, in in like neutrality norms. Right. Hey, so this is so. what this is where I want you to think about your answer of I know I could lose twenty pounds. Well, of course you do under your insanity. Right. <laughs> you, of course you know that because you've done the insanity and you got there with insanity. Yeah, so, I, yeah. So I guess, I guess. we know your body's capable of it, but it took it took an HCG protocol, and it took you know mm -hmm. micromanagement. It took isolation, mm -hmm. you know, which is what the protocol yeah. requires to some degree. So it's not that; it's reality. Okay. Of course, we isolate you or put you in a vacuum. The terminology of that, you know what that means, right? Do you know what it means uh, when we? It's in a vacuum. That terminology. In science, yeah. the science world, what, what it means to be in a vacuum? Yeah, like you're stuck all alone in a bottle. Yeah, you're, <laughs> you're basically like, eliminating yeah. as much environmental yeah. change as possible. And the right. reason we do that, you do that, and it's important in science, is so that you can see what's going on in a snapshot without influence. Once you add influence, it may not respond the same way. And that's the downside right. of science, too. It's like, how do we create a non-vacuum? We have to get it in a vacuum and then take it out. Right. So the truth of the right. matter is this HCG protocol is, in essence, a vacuum. Yes, right. In certain, in certain environments, you know, to some degrees, we can't control your emotional reactions, which is huge in terms of how your endocrine system is. Because if you have fear, your entire body goes into flame, in, inflamed. Mm -hmm. Insulin is produced. Your whole entire blood sugar levels go up without eating when you're under stress. How does that get impacted when you're under the influence of HCG, right? It can be magnified. So stress under the HCG protocol can magnify insulin resistance. Yeah. Just a thought, right? So when we do the HCG protocol, you're kind of doing something radical. Oh, yeah. So you right. know you yeah. can do it under that circumstance. But take that aside. I want you to open your mind to ask yourself about yourself. What would it be like in reality if I'm normal? I put quotes around that, okay? Because what is normal? But if you're a person that doesn't have an eating disorder or a body image insecurity, 
how would you relate to food? How would your relationship with food be if you're under stress? If you weren't restricting or moralizing food, how would you relate to food? And so there's that environment that you've never been exposed to. And what would then your body's natural body fat be without your influence? Right, I have no idea. That's the answer. <laughs> So this whole I, I idea of, I know it's within reach. Well, of course you do. I, I'm hoping But that's freaking crazy that. train you. Okay, sure. I mean, I could just hope, you know. So, but, that, but listen to you, though. But if you hope that, what's the likelihood you're going to be relaxed and willing to be a normal human being? I, I know. Like, that's the heck. Yeah. You're not. Yeah. No, I mean, I just... I don't know how to get rid of that because, like... Well, that's why we're talking, Gary. All the clothes in my <laughs> closet, like, I just want, I just want them to fit. You know? I like, understand I that. The so like, these are the like, things you have to surrender, right, to get to the place where we're describing, which is what is your real body? What is your genetic predisposition plus all the damage you've done? Because there is some irreparable damage done. Oh, yeah. You well, know, yeah. you have to be open to what that is, right? So when we look at what recovery is... Don't you agree recovery is getting rid of all the shit you've been doing to manage your weight? And it's also getting rid of this, your weight being the center of everything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Isn't that what recovery is? I want, yeah. I want recovery from this bullshit. Yeah. I want my life back. I want to be a normal person that doesn't obsess about what I, my weight. I don't want my weight to define if I feel good or bad in the day. And I don't want food to be the central focus either. One way or the right. other. Right? Yeah. That's because I, I don't know how to do that. Well, of course. That's why I said a second ago. I was like, well, that's where I come in. I'm your guy. That is. See, this is the thing, too. You probably didn't even know that existed. Like, there is a life out there where people don't feel terrible about themselves because of their weight? How does that happen? Right. Yeah, that's like totally foreign. Totally, to right? Me. But it yeah. does exist and it's right there. It is right there. It's just how do we, how, how is it that you can remove something from your identity, okay, that you've survived on? Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. it's a survival weapon and armor. Right. It has been both to you. It is, you know, dieting is a weapon against you, but it's also armor for you. So you have mm -hmm. this horribly dysfunctional codependent drama triangle with dieting and food and your weight, right? And it's, yeah. you could look at it and say, that's been a huge, like, that's my purpose in life, Robin. <laughs> I don't know how to be any other way. Yeah. This is my <laughs> life's purpose was to do this with all of my energy and my soul's existence. It's all about managing my weight. Right. And my family doesn't even know. Like my husband's gone there. Like, I don't know what time you're I can't keep track. Like, yeah. And he's know. thinking, I wonder if she'll ever get over it. <laughs> right. I mean, cause he, he doesn't, doesn't care. You know, oh, I love that. You got that going for you. Yeah. Cause yeah. I have clients whose husbands do care. Right. Right. That, that would be awful. Well, that it is, just is another I, step in <laughs> taking care of yourself. You know, you have to really look at, let's imagine that your husband did care in order to recover. Someone has to really honor and value their own soul. Yeah. I, I don't think, if my husband cared, I, I, oh, I, I don't even think I could ever recover. Well, you could, <laughs> of course you could. It would have to take you honoring your own soul over his. Right, right. Yeah, that's true. Okay, so not caring what he thought. Well, you have but. to preserve the existence of your life over pleasing him. Yeah. I, so do you see yeah, where it's like you'd have to really kind of take the codependency out of your relationship and become autonomous right. in, in caring for yourself, like really caring and honoring that you are alive and there is a soul and you do exist. And is it worth total and complete darkness? 
to please someone else. Right. I mean, I just, I don't know how someone... They do it all the time. Like, could be with someone like this. I mean, like, well, like... Why not? You're that way. Your husband is with someone like that. Yeah. Okay? So... <laughs> That's true. You're so right. And he loves you, said, and he's over it. So I said, I said stuff to him, not meanly, you know, not meanly. Yeah, but, but like, we should take care of our weight and be healthy. And then I'm like thinking, okay, I'm a freaking hypocrite because, like, look at me, like, <laughs> like he, you know, he's never been like as heavy as I, you know, like. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's over it. He probably is just like he sees that you have special <laughs> needs. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've been, yeah I've been right. There. So he's like, oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so he's giving you a lot of grace, right? A lot of forgiveness, a lot of grace to just be yourself, let her have her thing. And even if you do kind of force it onto him, he's probably just like, okay, whatever. But, anyways, back to you here. This process is about giving up what you get out of it. That's what's hard. If all we had to do is get rid of what you hate about it, no, no problem, right? Mm, right. Yes. You got to give up what you get out of it. And that is going to feel very challenging. Okay. Because it's like saying I have to give up my thinner clothes. Well, you have to look at what you, what is it worth? Like, what do you get in exchange Right? Let's look at that. If you if you allow your body to be natural, okay? Keep in mind to get to that natural body, you eliminate all the shit you hate. So you get to eliminate everything you hate. The micromanagement of food, the obsessive compulsiveness around dieting, you no longer have morality with food either, so there's no bad or good food, there's no anxiety when you eat. You're no longer micromanaging your weight because you're allowing the body to manage itself. So it's no, you no longer are in charge of it. Right? Yeah. <clears throat> Just think of the freedom that gives you. Right. And I've been, I've been, I've been trying it, you know, and, and with, 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 you know, pretty, pretty good success. Like I, I it's definitely hard because it's, it's all new and yeah, and totally. It's very confusing. I'm like, I go to the grocery store. I'm like, what? What, what do I do? do? Well, like, of course, I don't, you I just don't. jumped off of the HCG protocol. It's kind of, it's like disorienting. I get that, but I want you to, I really want you to think about this. If how do, how are we gonna find out what it's like to not have to do all this crap if you're not willing to let it all go? The only way to let all this crap go is for you to be open-minded about what your body is on its own, with its own regulation. Right, and and I've been doing that. Like, I, you know, I've bought stuff I, you know, like I've been eating whatever I want, you know, and I've been trying to hone in on that hunger scale, and it's it's pretty, I mean, I, I'm doing well at it. I mm -hmm. just, it's the, the extreme, the... The extremes are easy. You know, I definitely can can mm -hmm. feel what, like, really being, like, like when you're really hungry and then, like, full. But it's, it's that middle gray area, like, okay, well, you know, like, just get being at just a five and a half or something. You know, like, you know, stopping before you're full. Like, Yeah, well, and what I found over the years when I, is that it's very difficult, um, to discern that when you are stressed about your weight. So, you know, what I wrote in weight loss apocalypse is very relevant. In fact, to me, it's like, that is the goal, but the problem I ran into, and this is what I'm writing about um, to update it is the problem with that is when people bring in this emotional attachment to their weight is that they're not, they don't, you know, for example, when people, I found that during the very low calorie phase of the protocol that as people were once within safe food, there was no option of bad or, you know, moral bad food, right? You're within a very small range of safe food. That for one gave people yeah. a sense of like, I can relax because all the food I'm eating isn't even tempting. 
so I get to learn this. So there's a benefit to that. The downside is that your people aren't really engaged with their true relationship with food. They're kind of in a vacuum, right? The second thing that I noticed is during the very low calorie protocol is the hunger scale was very easy to follow because they were losing weight. So they didn't have to worry about their weight. So they were given two benefits that gave them complete, they could just yeah. focus in on the hunger <laughs> scale because they could rely that they were losing weight and they were eating food that were safe. So it was too very vacuumy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As yeah. soon as they transitioned on to the phase two or P3, um, is they would, uh, all of a sudden, they'd have to reintegrate food, and they made them feel unsafe with food. But the reason is because they were super fearful of regaining weight. So once they became fearful of regaining weight, that changed how they, re you know, how they felt about food. They became scared yeah. of food. So now, once you add, add the hunger scale to that, does it even work? What I found is people who were on the very low calorie protocol found it easy. All of a sudden, the hunger scale was very hard to read because they were experiencing anxiety. The hunger scale works really great when you're with, when you feel safe with food and there is no tension or pressure around what you get out of it. So as, right. so as soon as you are afraid of the food you're eating, that immediately clouds your response to it. And second, if you're afraid to gain weight, what that does is it pressurizes the hunger scale to be, you have to be perfect because if you're not perfect, you could gain weight. So it changes the hunger scale to a diet. So it's kind of the same like emotional projection about your weight into the hunger scale. And so the concept I wrote about in weight loss apocalypse doesn't work. It's like inappropriate. It doesn't right. work because the hunger scale is meant to be used in a relaxed state. It's not a survival way of eating. A survival way of eating is very different. If your uh, survival mode with food is being triggered, are you going to be relaxed and eating no. minimally? Right. <laughs> no. It, it is interesting. It reminded me of, you know, there's times when I... I'll go in my kids' room and bring out dishes, and you know they leave so much crap in there, and and and, uh, <clears throat> and it just reminded me of when you were talking about like like how kids eat, you know, how mm -hmm. like it's like magic, it's like amazing, because like I'll go in the room and I'll bring out a cup, and it's like it's got like he like he made like a chocolate shake, yeah, well, he's got like quarter of it left, and I'm like, <sighs> how could you, how he could you not drink the number whole Number one, and, number uh, one. He doesn't feel bad about himself for having a milkshake. Right. Number two, right. he doesn't think he did anything wrong. Number three, he doesn't feel he deprived. He doesn't right. have a sense of, I've done something wrong and I'm never going to get it again. Number four, <laughs> right? So do you see what I mean by you're, you're like an animal when you are in survival with food? He's clearly relaxed right. and is like, oh, I'm going to be sick. I shouldn't eat anymore. He's not thinking, right. I'm not going to get it anymore. I've done something wrong. I've ruined it. I should drink all and then maybe I should go get a bag of donuts. <laughs> right. I am just like, I'm like, like, oh, wait, this, is, this, is, this is what's normal. <laughs> yeah, but you what, what, it's not just, and this is, again, this is how much we've uh, evolved with this hunger scale in relation to dieting and how, how I teach it. It's like, again, what I wrote in Weight Loss Apocalypse is idealistic. That's what I witness when people don't have this craziness about their weight. It is as easy as I described. Right. As soon as someone has these issues with weight, it is complicated. Right. It is like, full of anxiety. Yeah. It is projecting all their emotional biases into it. So they're no longer really relaxed. They're trying to use the hunger scale to benefit their ego and their survival mode. So it doesn't work. It's not aggressive enough. It's not controlling enough. Yeah. You need more rigidity. So what I found is people started making, taking away what I wrote about, which is you should have the freedom to eat like a normal human being. And they said, no, you can't. You have to reduce sugar and eat to hunger. You have to take away gluten and eat to hunger. You have to take away dairy and eat to hunger. And so they're trying to eat to hunger while they're removing themselves as an animal from their animal realm right you're not allowing yourself to be a pack animal anymore right and so they and I, yeah and i actually wrote that i was like uh what did 
I write? Oh yeah, do I still want carbs or anything? Question mark. <laughs> you know, like. Well, that means do I still need to be super vigilant and scared of food? <laughs> Which I assume no. Well, pause. I don't want you to assume it. I want you to feel it. I want you to really feel the answer here for yourself. Right. I mean, it, it, why would you be afraid of food? What is the reason you're fearful of food? Well, I think it's, oh, it's, I mean, a lot of it's just the diet industry is, you know, ingrained in your head. Like, carbs are bad. Fear mongered. But what is the, that in relation to? What they do to your Blood sugar level. Okay, but what is that in relation to? (laughs) To gaining weight. Correct. It is in relation to thin supremacy. Right. If they really wanted to, if they really cared about your blood sugar, they would be focusing on stress. (laughs) Because anxiety and stress is an actual promotion of the breakdown of blood uh, glycogen in your liver it's called gluconeogenesis, and then when you're stressed, you naturally produce blood sugar without eating. Why aren't they concerned about that? That's called diabetes. Right, right. But it's supposed to work that way, but they don't focus on that. They focus on demonizing food, which tells me they have an alternative motive, which is to sell something or to promote a belief system that they uh, is religious to them. They're superior right. in their way of eating, and they want people to follow them because they're pathological narcissists. Right. Because I think I'd like, so I'd rather eat less, and it, if I could eat things I like and enjoy and want, you know, like, I'd rather, because I found it doesn't take very much. Not when you're all. under stress, especially if you feel like you're eating something that's bad for you. Or, I mean, it, I found, like, when I'm eating eating any food, like, it doesn't take much to take to take that mm-hmm. hunger feeling away. Like, it, it it doesn't take a lot of food <laughs> at, no. at all, you know. And so, you know, then I'm like, oh, gosh, like, it tastes so good, you know. It's like, <laughs> I, 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 like, I want so more. Like, <laughs> yeah, I'm being so deprived in this moment, my first world environment. <laughs> but then I just have to realize that, okay, well, I... 10 minutes, you know, if I'm, I'm hungry again, and you can have more, I can have more, right? Yeah. So the problem is if you've demonized the food. So this tells me a lot about the morality you bring to that food. I shouldn't be eating it. I can't eat this later. This is bad for me. So there's a lot of underlying brainwashing that you bring into that, which is why it's not available to you later. You're not supposed to eat it ever. So if I give myself a reason to eat it now and I'm okay with it now, I can't eat it again later. I'm not supposed to be eating it at all. So it feels like you're doing something wrong. So you see how that can cloud the hunger scale? I mean, you can't even focus on the hunger scale. You're focusing on your guilt, feeling like you're doing something dangerous. Right. And I I totally experienced that when I had to work on Saturday. Because I, so Friday night we went out, you know, and decided, okay, that's a minute in the protocol, you know, so, so, but, but I mean, I'm, Still, like, I think I actually I hadn't I hadn't totally decided at that point. I think Saturday I went to work and I brought my brought my yeah. normal lunch, my lunch, you know, check mm-hmm. in and my boring lunch, and had every intention to stay on protocol, you know. And then the doctor ordered pizza, <laughs> which is my like absolute favorite thing in the world, you know. So then I, you know, I give in and I okay, I'll have one piece. Well, since I haven't been able to have it, and I think, oh, this is bad, you know, and then, oh, my gosh, this tastes so good. Like, I don't want to stop. Yeah, so this arbitrary I'll have one piece that you decided ahead of time, that's dieting. Right, and and, and one turned into two. and you That's know, what happens. And, and then, I, then I, I caught myself feeling guilty. I, I caught myself going right back into that that cycle that I've always have been in. And well, you know, I I would expect Karen for that cycle to stay there and to be there. I don't expect you to just get rid of it. We have to go into your issues with your weight and the desire to be thin. And we have to really resolve those for that to go away. So again, just by me mentioning it, I don't expect you to just make changes. I'm hopefully what we're doing at this point is I'm really saying we need to look at the big picture because your desire to be thin is so strong, 
these are the natural consequences. This is what's been promoted in your behavior, right? Yeah. And so yeah. I don't expect you to change that behavior until you've actually addressed the underlying issues, right? Well, I mean, I, I, I did actually, so at, after that day, I realized, okay, this is a serious problem. Like, you know, I have, now I for sure have to stop this protocol and, and just, I have to do what Robin says to do is, okay. is not think food's bad, you know, and, and then the next day, like I made my son a frozen pizza, you know, I took one, I took enough to, to, to be satisfied. And I, and I was okay with it. I didn't, I didn't need to eat more of it. You know, like I bought ice cream and I, and I said, okay, I'm going to buy cones, you know, so I'll allow, I mean, I guess I shouldn't say I'll allow myself, but I'll put it on a cone instead of filling a bowl. And I was perfectly satisfied. I mean, so I guess I'm, I guess I'm making like maybe little baby steps. I think, I I think, I think you are, and there is a learning curve to this. So, so you do need to. I think that's what my point was a little a little bit ago, was to say, yeah. hey, don't expect yourself to be perfect right now. Oh, There's a no, lot right, we right. haven't gone over. Like I'm, right, I'm, what might be happening is you're kind of overcompensating right now with your food, because you're so with you've been so chronically deprived, at least told you can't eat these things. You know, even though you could look at your behavior and you go, oh, I eat them, <laughs> I eat these things, but it's always with shame and guilt. You never really relaxed into eating them. So what I see and what I'm hearing is that you're potentially kind of overcompensating with your choices and that's to be expected. But what do you think is going to happen physically? What, what do you think is going to happen physically, especially to that kind of beginning of that leanerness that you were getting with the protocol? If you jump off of it right now and you go into eating freely, what do you expect to happen to your body? Yeah, I mean, I, I am well aware. I, I, would will most likely gain. Yeah, and you just have to allow it to happen as mm-hmm. you're as you have this learning curve. So right now, that's why it's like you're gonna gain weight. I mean, you're overcompensating mm-hmm. with your choices, and that's totally fine. And we're still learning the hunger skill, but and as you reduce the stress around your weight gain, you'll find that it's so much easier to actually follow. Right. So as you kind of that pendulum swing comes into the center and balances in the center. That'll, you'll kind of get into a groove with it and you're going to experience your body's natural shifts, which might be weight gain. So the key here right now for you as your guide, I'm here to tell you, I really need you to just accept right now you're going to gain weight. Just expect it to happen. I want you, I don't, I'm not giving you permission to overeat and make it happen. I just need you to be open to it and willing for that to happen so that you can be given a space to figure this out. I don't want you under pressure. Yeah. And I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm just not going to, I'm just not going to weigh myself. Well, I need you to expect it. So what you're saying is I'm just going to stay in denial about it. No, (laughs) no, don't do that. I need you to go into your mind what I'm telling you to do, just trust me, I am saving you a lot of problems by telling you to do this. Yeah. If you hope you don't gain weight, how are you going to feel when you start feeling your pants get tight? It's going to suck. You're going to have problems. So what I'm telling you is if you can go in to expect it now, give yourself in this process grace to figure this out. You need to give yourself room so that you don't have pressure of perfection or impulsivity when you feel you're getting heavier because you never addressed it to begin with. Address it to begin with. This is our first session and I am giving you right now the best solution to these issues that has the least amount of damages involved. Okay. Okay. So should I, should I just wear uh, just, you know, exercise. Pay, like, no, I, be yeah, comfortable. I, I want you to be that? comfortable. Just dress comfortably, but I want you to know ahead of time. I look at this from a big picture point of view. Okay, imagine someone who has never really learned how to eat, and they've always been promoted to be starved. 
and they go from all over consuming to starving themselves and over consuming. And for the first time in their life, they are given the respect and the space to learn how to, to eat with their body. Right. The first thing right. you would tell them is, you know what? Don't be afraid to gain weight because that's what's going to happen. If you're afraid to gain weight, you're not really changing anything. You're right. So <laughs> give, you would give this grace to someone else. Yeah. I Why don't you go, deserve go, it? Go buy new clothes. <laughs> I mean, whatever, well, you yeah. just go with it. Just go with yeah. the process. Why do, yeah, expect to gain weight, but wear clothes that fit you today. And as you get bigger, get bigger clothes. I'm assuming you have them. Um, I mean, I, I kind of was, I kind of had, it's been a long time since I kind of got back to here. So I don't, I have some. Yes. Okay. So a, tell me this, if this was your teenage daughter, okay, just, just put that out there. Would you go by to the store and buy her a bunch of big baggy clothes right now? Or would you say, you know, we'll go shopping when you need it. Don't worry about it. Oh, right. The, the latter. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it's loving. Yeah. That's what I'm doing for you. I'm being your mom right now. Hey, sweetie, don't worry about it. Except for it's your money. <laughs> Not mine. <laughs> Go buy your own clothes when you need it. <laughs> yeah. And get what's comfortable. And don't don't worry about this in the end. In the end, this is all... You might not see it clearly right now, but you need to go through this to get a clearer picture. Like, you need to re got to refocus your lens, and the only way to allow it to happen is for you to get rid of that end result. Right. And, and this is what I've never ever done before I think I mean I was always too afraid to do it probably or no, I'm here to guide you, know. you just just you just got to trust um that my guidance is loving caring and that I have I can see the picture yeah I can see it and I can see where you're at and I'm found I, there's a route and we're gonna go each step by step I'm not going I'm not gonna make you do five steps at once we're gonna go step by step yeah. And the first step in order for you to take it is I can't afford, you can't afford, okay, to hope that you stay thin. I already know, and I've tried to explain it to you, and when you re-listen to this session, you'll hear it a little better probably. You can't afford to hope you're going to stay thin because you're not going to relax. Right, right. It's like gambling. It's like, you're, what's the probability that you're going to gain weight as you learn this? And you're going to suck at it to start. And you're overcompensating with excessive bad food. So, you know, which is what I would expect and, and actually what you kind of need to do to get over it. Right? You're right. Yeah. So, and you just have to trust that as you get hone in on what hunger feels like and you hone in on what it what it feels like for it to go away as you're eating food you enjoy and you relearn how to do this, that your body's going to naturally take care of itself. That it isn't irreparable. If you gain weight, the body knows how to lose weight. It doesn't need you. Right. 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 It'll manage itself as you become, you know, consistent and reliable and realistic with it, that your body is going to find its natural state of existing. And it's yeah. not going to require any restriction on your part, any insanity, any obsessive compulsive exercise. It's not going to require anything. How does that sound? Yeah, that sounds like pure freedom. Well, that's, okay. that's what we have to find out first. And if there's ever another round in your future, we have to get to that place first. Where right. is your body's natural endocrine system without all of this emotional baggage? Yeah. You have to find right, out. Right. You you got to be willing to gain 20 pounds if that's what it is. If that's what it is, you probably have an endocrine problem. Don't you want to know what that is? Right. Plus, we need to get you engaged with eating like a real person. Now, what that does is it, it allows you to trust your own body's biological rhythm, that you actually trust it and and have a relationship with it to where you can rely on it with all foods, all variety of foods. 
what that does, if you ever do another round, is it allows you to feel not only excited to get off the protocol, but to feel less strained and fearful because you've already learned and can rely on this way of eating. And so you, the whole pro, it becomes a medical procedure, not some weird diet. Right. Yeah. Cause I just found when I was it more so this time than the first time, but I found like I was feeling so, I was feeling super deprived and I wanted so bad to eat other food than just chicken and vegetables and yeah. an apple. I, I was like, I was like, Oh my God, I'm going to go insane. Like, yeah. Well, <laughs> you're, you're experiencing feeling deprived and that, that again, that goes along with how you were approaching the protocol. Right. If right. so, I want you to get your sciency nursing hat on, and I want you to look at this as like a medical procedure. Yeah. So if how do we even know you're a good candidate if you've never really allowed your body to be to show its natural state? Right. So one of the things you could do, um, give it two to three months. Of, of this process and you actually being consistent and reliable with eating to hunger, get your blood work done. Okay. Get your yeah. blood work done. How old are you? 47. Yeah. Okay. Have you had your, are you, have you, are you in menopause right now? No, no. Um, I don't even, I don't have hot flashes. I don't. Okay. No sign I'm of it. Still very regular. Okay. So this would be really, this is great news. If you were like in the middle of menopause, I'd be like, oh, well, we kind of need to wait till you're done with menopause, but let's do it. Right. So look at it th through the lens of the scientist. Get your freaking emotional baggage out of here. Mm -hmm. Right? Like just do that. <laughs> yeah. So that's where our work really comes in. So that's what we've got to be able to do to be able to get you to where you're okay gaining weight. Because you have to be okay gaining weight to be relaxed in how you learn to eat the hunger. Yeah. It's, that's the way it is. If you're not okay right. gaining weight, you will never be relaxed enough to actually figure it out. All right. And then I, and then I see normally like when, you know, when I do gain weight and I kind of, normal behavior is to kind of like shut myself off from the world and don't go anywhere. Don't do well, anything. That's your shame. That's your shame coming out. Yeah. Yeah. So we need to resolve those things. So we'll, that's what we're going to start working on. Oh my, God, my armpits. I'm so sweaty today. <laughs> oh, you'll see it in the video. It's ridiculous. Yeah. But then, so, I mean, I, you know, I don't, at this point, I mean, I still like, like I went out the other night. I mean, because I've been heavier than I am now. You know, I have been. And, and, but I went out the other night, you know, and my friend's like, see, you're, st you know, you still had a fun time. You're mm -hmm. still, you know, mm -hmm. no one thought any, no one, no one even, no one thought anything, you know? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, yeah, okay, yeah, you're right. Yeah. Well, it's, I, it's what you think. Screw everybody else. We got to get you to you to really change your perception around it. So we have to really, we need to question if being thinner is really superior, if it requires you're so self-centered about yourself. Right. And if gaining weight and having body fat is inferior, if it means you are not self-centered about it, if that's what your body's natural way of being is, should you feel bad about it? No. Okay, no. so that right there, you need to contemplate. You need to, that is your assignment at this point. I need you to contemplate if your body's natural way of being is a little heavier, is that worthy of shame, hiding, guilt? Should someone no. permanently, because if it is your natural way of being, that means to be thinner, you would permanently have to diet forever. Right. Should someone have to permanently diet their entire life just to fit a standard that society says they need to be to feel good about themselves? I mean, that's like saying my life isn't mine anymore. It's devoted to dieting so that other people will like me. So I don't really get to live my life. I have to focus on doing what I need to do for other people to look at me and go, you're a pro-go-ball. Yeah, that's been my whole life. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sounds a little ridiculous, doesn't it? Yeah, it's miserable. 
Yeah. So wh why is it not? Why doesn't that misery that you just said? Why doesn't that? Why don't you get to bring that to the table? But this is miserable. Yeah. Yeah. Why would you do it? It's miserable. Really add to that the misery of this way of being. You don't get to live. Your, your life, your energy and focus is to make sure you're thin. So what happened to your free will? Why don't you get to enjoy your life? Because you have to focus on keeping your thinness. Right. So is thinness really all of what you're saying it is? Well, that's, you know, the fantasy is. So um, I have to go, and I have, so I want you to, we need to schedule, and I want to schedule soon. Like, I think we should talk in the next few days just to kind of follow up this conversation so that we make sure the foundation of our work, I mean, we have a lot to cover, if you can't tell, and I think yeah. this conversation we need to keep on having, but I have to go. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, Let me yeah, stop this.